Okay, Caesar, why don't you go ahead and start giving out those handouts that you have. Our Christ object lesson today will be given by Elidia. Soila, okay, one of you. Not quite ready for that. We'll wait till we get those handouts passed out. Okay, let us bow our heads for our invocation. Father in heaven, it is indeed a, both a pleasure and a blessing to meet in your house in person, to share your word, to pray to you, and to ask for blessings in the future and to thank you for blessings in the past. I pray, Lord, now you bless those of us who are here, that your spirit may go with each one of us as we leave here at the end of the service that you will direct our steps and our way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll have Christ's object lesson now. Good morning. Is there any children here? Oh, there. Good morning. Mice. The story today is about um, guardian angels. And for Good morning, everyone on Zoom. It's about guardian angels. And I don't know uh, if you guys all know, we all have a guardian angel. And I don't know if you can see this picture. For those of you on Zoom, it's a picture of a guardian angel protecting a little boy and a little girl crossing a bridge. Can everybody see that? It's one of my favorite pictures. It's actually a favorite of my sister's and I. And my sister's actually here today. It's her birthday. Happy birthday, sister. Um, so, it, so this picture really has sentimental, um, a lot of sentimental value to me because um, growing up, my grandma had it in our room. And also because I realized that we went through so many things together. We were very adventurous. I'm going to tell a story about my sister and I, and I know that our guardian angel was working overtime when we were growing up. We always, we grew up um, in the country, so there was always things to do, um, and we were, we didn't get into trouble, but we did things that were pretty dangerous. And when I look back now, I think, um, I'm going to share with you a couple of things that we went through where I know our guardian angel was there protecting us. We went to live in Mexico when I was about 10 and she was about 8. And in Mexico, you have free reign to everything. You're always outdoors. You're never indoors. And so one time that I remember, um, we were out exploring and we saw an anthill. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but that's the anthill. And if you can see the ants, sorry, the ants, those, they're the big red ants. They're not the little black ones. So here's a picture of the ant hill and the red ants. So we decided that we were going to run across the ant hill and see if the ants could bite us. And since, since I'm such a good sister, I t made my little sister go first because I wanted her to be first. So she ran across the ant hill, and by the time she got to the other side, the ants were all over her legs. And I noticed that her legs started to swell up. It was like immediate. Her legs started to swell up. And I don't know from where. I didn't, never took any training or knew this. But I thought to take off, I don't know if it was a belt, uh, to tie it around her leg to stop the swelling. And thank God that um, that helped because we were not going to go home and tell my mom that we ran over an anthill because we would get it worse when we got home. 
Um, and I believe that it was my guardian angel that was there protecting us. And by the time we got home, the swelling had, got down, had, had gone down, and we didn't have to tell mom, thankfully. But that was one moment where our guardian angel was there protecting us. Another time, still in Mexico, we used to love to climb trees. And now when I look at trees, it's a picture of a tree. We would climb trees like this. I mean, big, giant trees. And we couldn't just climb to the bottom of it. We had to get to the very, very top. We would climb these trees, and we would sing Christmas songs, and we'd tell stories. And we were there for hours until we got hungry, and then we'd come down. But I think about it now. Is that sometimes I walk, and when I see a big tree, I think, how did we not fall down and break our necks? It's our guardian angels. I know that they were protecting us. I mean, we were, I don't know how we went up there. I think I, I can't, I don't think I can even climb the bottom layer, let alone go all the way to the top. So again, who protected us? Our guardian angel. Another time, we decided we were going to go visit our friends, and they lived far away. And we took one of the horses that was there. I don't even remember whose horse it was. And it didn't have a saddle, so this is what it looked like. We took this horse and... On the way up there, of course, this here's the horse. On the way up there, um, we took our time. Um, and we lost track of time when we were over there. And it started to get dark. And it was a long trip back. So all of a sudden, we realized it was getting late. And it was, we was going to be dark by the time we got home. So we decided that we were going to get on that horse and just make the horse just run. So we got on the horse. And I'm holding on to the hair. And my sister is holding on to me. And the horse is just running. And I don't know, we didn't fall, nothing happened to us. And to me, that's one of the moments that I think my guardian angel was with us. Because I don't know how we made it. We made it home on that horse, me holding onto the hair and my sister holding onto me. And I was not a horse rider. She was better than I, at it than I was. But those are some of the moments that I think God sent our guardian angel for a reason. My guardian angel, right now, we're older. We can't do those things anymore. I'm, I'm sure they're resting now from all the things that I could tell you story upon story about things that we did uh, where I know our guardian angel was there and protected us. And so I just want to tell you guys that, especially you young boys over there and anybody on Zoom, always remember that. God loves you so much that he made a special angel just for you to watch over you. So every time you're out there, uh, re and don't do the things that we did, no ant hills and <laughs> climbing trees to the top is just to sing a Christmas song. Uh, remember that you have your guardian angel always watching over you, and that's how much God loves you. Um, so can you bow our heads for a moment? Father God, I just want to thank you. I thank you, Lord, because you love us so much that you made an angel just for each and every one of us, Lord. And one day that angel is going to show us things that we went through that we didn't even know and how you sent that angel to protect us. I thank you that you love us that much. So um, thank you, Father, and be with us the rest of this um, program. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's uh, that time, one of my favorite times of the service, a time when we can return thanks to God in a meaningful way. Time for our offering appeal, and this time it's for our local church budget. If you look at the figures in the bulletin, if you have one, you see our local church budget is a little bit in arrears, and we need some help to get it caught up. I'd also like to make an appeal to those of you who are partaking on Zoom. Next week, why not come and partake in person? It's safer than you think. The church has installed in the heating system ultraviolet lamps that destroy virus and bacteria. The fans run continuously, and the air is changed in the church several times an hour, so we're breathing clean air. We'd like to invite you folks. Plus, it's easier for you to give offering. Okay. Let's bow our heads for our congregational prayer and kneel, those who can.
Father in heaven, we are here because you are here. We are here because you have protected us throughout this past week. We have health, we have strength, perhaps not much, but what we have, we thank you for it. Lord, this church has a job to do in this community. It is my prayer that we can do so. It is my prayer that you will overrule Satan as he tries to destroy and turn another of his supposed victories into yet another of his defeats. Lord, whenever have you surrendered to Satan? Satan has been forced to exit the scene of battle, writhing in humiliation and rage. Lord, I pray that may happen again. I pray that this church may be set on fire by you so that we can reach out to our community and get your work done. Lord, I pray you'll be with each member here. I pray that the Holy Spirit may come into each heart. Direct our thoughts heavenward as we have our sermon today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning to everyone that is out there in Zoom land. We, uh, we miss you. We wish you were here with us. Uh, but I hope that wherever you are at, that you will feel God's presence with you. It, it's been a long time since I was here last. It's been approximately 14 years, and uh, Eileen brought that uh, to my attention when we had the memorial service for Ron. And I uh, want to thank this congregation, this church, and every one of you for uh, providing the support to the Levi family and to Eileen. And so I want to just uh, acknowledge your efforts to help someone that has lost a significant other in their life. Many years ago, I used to come regularly to this church to preach to the Spanish. And I want to thank this congregation for reaching out into the Spanish community and sharing the gospel. We have an obligation as a, as a church to share the greatest message to the whole world. I mean, how many of us realize how important it is, our health message? Our health message is a message that the world needs to listen to. Our message of Christ's second coming, that he's coming soon, and that we need to prepare for it is something that we need to share with everyone. It's, it's important. God has placed us at this time in this earth's history to share the greatest message of mankind that we can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That is a great and wonderful message. And God has placed you and me at this point in time to share that message. When we look at everyone that's wearing masks, we're realizing that prophecies are being fulfilled. And those prophecies is that in the last days, there's going to be pandemics. There's going to be pestilences. And yes, we can say back in the Middle Ages, they had the Black Death, and that was a pandemic. And even at the beginning of last, the last millennium in the, in the early 1900s, we had the Spanish flu. And I always wondered, why did we ever call it the Spanish flu? Because 
Some of that flu started here in a military base in Oklahoma at Fort Sill. And I'm saying to myself, in Arkansas, and I'm saying to myself, why did we call it the Spanish flu? Because when our troops went over to Europe, they helped spread it there in France, and then it hit Spain. And when it hit Spain, it wiped out a huge congregation. I mean, a, a lot of population there. And so when we look at our point in time in history today, where with all the technology and with all the medicines, we are still being devastated by this pestilence that we call COVID-19. We know that we have been called to share a message of preparation that Jesus is coming soon. Let's prepare for him. The message that I brought today is a message found in the book of Jonah. And Jonah, too, was preaching a message of preparation to a people that were oblivious to the fact that their end would come soon. They were oblivious because they had all the power, all the wealth. They had military might. They were at the zenith point of their history, and God tells this prophet, I would like for you to go and preach to the Ninevites. And you know, he didn't want to do it, but God had a plan. Those are my people too. Those are part of my creation. And yes, even though you may not like them, and even though, yes, they, they, they are not nice people, and yes, even though they like to conquer uh, nations, I need you with the gift you have of speaking, of persuasion, with your ability and natural ability to speak, I need you to go there and preach the gospel. As I get into this message today, let us pray. And let us ask God that we too can use our gifts, our talents, our resources to share the greatest message of the world that Jesus saves. That God may help us share that message with others. Let us pray. Dear God, we've come here today to worship you. We've come here today to have fellowship with one another, with those present and with those on Zoom. We've also come here to study your word. We humbly ask, Lord, that your word may speak to us. But more than that, we pray that your word will transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit. But even more than that, Lord, we pray that after you have sanctified us and justified us and made us a holy instrument, that we will go out of our way just like you called Jonah to go out of his way to share the greatest message of all time, that God loves us and wants to save us. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that we could have a second chance of salvation. Be with us now. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. When we look at the book of Jonah, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Jonah. And I would like to invite you to read with me the last chapter of Jonah. Jonah only has four chapters. It's one of the greatest books of all time, I think. 
Because it's incredible how a man survived being swallowed up by a huge fish. Many of us think he was, he was somehow swallowed up by a whale. And there has been documented cases where someone was swallowed up by a sperm whale. When he was out there in the little boat trying to harpoon this whale, the whale flipped the boat over. He was swallowed up. That whale was eventually caught. And as they started to open up the stomach of that whale, who do you think they found inside? They found one of those spearmen, one of those men that was trying to harpoon that whale. They found him inside, still alive, and he was able to tell his story. Even though he was covered up and half burnt with all these stomach acids, he survived. How did Jonah survive? I don't know. And sometimes I ask myself, how did he survive for three days? I don't know. And why do I say three days? Because Jesus alluded to Jonah, and, and, and he referred to him just like Jonah was three days and three nights. You know, I too will be three days and three nights, but then I'll resurrect. And I want you to know, I don't know if it was 72 hours or parts of three days and parts of three nights, but I want you to know Jesus Christ did resurrect. And I want you to know Jonah is a true story. I've always wondered why, how, how did this happen? I don't know. But because Jesus referred to it, I believe it happened. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 4, and I'm going to read in verse 6 the following. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, have, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And it ends with a question mark. I've always wondered how many people lived in, in Seaside. I live in Seaside. And so I went to the city and I said, I asked myself, what is the demographics of this town? And they told me, well, we have approximately 36,000 people here. And I, and I said, well, what is the, the breakdown? And they told me, well, the last census was more than 10 years ago. And so we're doing a new census now. And so they told me that, well, we expect the population to be close to 48, 47, 48 percent Hispanic. Oh, OK. And, and how about English, you know, wh white America? And, and he, well, we expect them to be right around 28%. And, and, and what about uh, uh, blacks? And they said, well, they were 7% 10 years, 10 years ago at the last census, but they're probably going to be 5% or less. And, and how about Asians? And they said, well, about 15%. And I came back and I told my wife, we have to do more 
in our community to reach out and make a difference. We can't just stay isolated in our comfort zone. We have to reach out and try to make our church known in this community and we need to make a difference in this community because if all we do is stay within our own ethnicity, we will not be able to do God's bidding in God's time and in God's place. When I read the story of Jonah, I read about a man that had the gift of evangelism. He had the gift of speaking. If you have that gift of speaking, I want to encourage you, use it for God. If you have the gift of building, use your gift for God. If you have the gift of teaching, use that gift for God and teach others how to use their gifts. We're living in a time when our church needs to make a difference. We need to make a difference. And God called Jonah. And he said, Jonah, I need you to make a difference. And I would like for you to go to Nineveh. And you know, God was calling him out of his comfort zone. God was asking him to do something he didn't want to do. And so he decided to do his own will. And that's when God let him know, I am still in charge. I am still in charge. When we get to chapter 4, we find that God is still in charge. And you'll notice how, the, how God works. God can work miracles overnight. He can change your situation overnight. And even if you think this situation is hopeless, God has ways of taking your hopelessness and flipping it over and turning it into a blessing. As I read verse 6, and I'd like for you to read with me chapter 4, verse 6, it says like this, Then the Lord provided a vine. He provided a plant. He provided some, some vegetables. Some, he prepared something. But I want you to know, God is in the business of preparing things for you and for me. He's in the business of preparing opportunities. He's in the business of preparing you for higher and greater service. And he's, he's in the business of taking whatever there is at hand and turning it and preparing it so that it can be a blessing to you, the church, and the community. As I look at this verse, underline with me some things. I like to always underline things in the Bible. And you probably wonder, you know, my wife said, I never write anything in the Bible. And I said, well, that's because I'm dyslexic. And I, like, I have to underline things so that when I read, it helps, me, it helps me see things. And so I wrote here, God provided a vine. That means God prepared a vine. God anticipated this is what's going to happen. And so he prepared a vine. Verse 7. Go to verse 7. What else did God prepare? It says here in verse 7, And at dawn the next day, God provided what? A worm. You know, a worm, you may think it's insignificant, but I mean, how important? I mean, how important is a worm? I mean, we don't think of it as being that important, do we? But God said, I'm going to use the most insignificant thing to many people, 
And I'm going to illustrate. I'm going to use that to illustrate a point. God prepared a worm. And what happened? That vine started to wither. But more than that, verse 8, if you have your Bibles there in verse 8, what else? It says in verse 8, then the sun arose and God provided what? A scorching east wind. How many times do us do we think, oh, it's windy today, big deal. But you know, God has purpose in everything. And God can use the good, the bad, and the ugly to do his bidding. And, and here, when we look at what happened to Jonah in this situation, God is preparing things to help Jonah realize, hey, people are priceless. People are important to me. And I need you to realize that even though you value this plant that has been giving you shade, I need you to realize and to get out of your comfort zone that we are in the people business. We are in the business of sharing the greatest message on earth, even to people that we may not like. And so, when we read the rest of the story, you're going to find that God prepared a great wind on the sea when Jonah was trying to run away from doing God's will. And God lifted up a storm. He said, I'm going to use this great storm to try to catch the attention of Jonah because I need him to do this, my bidding. And so in, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, we find God preparing a storm. We, got, we find God preparing the wind. We find even in verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17, that God prepares a great fish. And it was out of that fish inside that fish that Jonah prayed like he never prayed before. Why? Because he knew he had messed up. Have any of you ever prayed when you've messed up? I have. I think we all have. And I want you to know God answers prayer even when we miss, miss up. Amen? God is in the business of helping us. He's in the business of giving us a second chance. We serve a God that will forgive us if we ask for forgiveness. And it was in the belly of that fish that Jonah started to pray like he had never prayed before. Do you know why? Because his situation was hopeless. Who was going to fish him out of that situation? No one. The only one that could help him was God. And I want to encourage all of you, if you're facing a difficult situation in your life, if you're facing a situation that you may seem uh, or believed is hopeless, or if you know of someone that is facing a difficult situation that is hopeless, share Jesus. Pray with them. Because even if we die in Jesus Christ, we will live again. And that's the blessed hope that Jesus offers us. He offers us, yes, immortality in a better world when he comes for his people. That's what God does for us. You know, I was sharing with my wife at this last past week, and I said to my wife, have you ever heard of Gilgamesh? 
And, and, and she said, no, and, and Gilgamesh was in our lesson. It was in our Sabbath school lesson. And I said, I'm surprised that they mentioned the name Gilgamesh on Sunday's lesson of last week. And I said, do you know who that person was? And she said, no. It's the oldest myth, myth in antiquity. And where did it come from? Nineveh. And it was about this man that was really a, like a Hercules, Samson type of man, half God, half man, and he was mean, and he was always fighting these ferocious animals. And one day the, he angers the, the gods, and the gods say to themselves, we're going to get rid of this. We need to get rid of this man. And so they sent one of the greatest fighters that they could find, and his name was Enkidu. And Enkidu goes down and he starts to fight with Gilgamesh and they fight and they fight and they struggle and they struggle all day and, and, and at the end of the day, guess what? They couldn't beat each other. It was a tie. And as a result of that tie, Gilgamesh and Enkidu become best friends. They become best friends. And, and the gods get more angry. And, and, and they sent this bull, and, 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 and this, this, this great bull attacks both Enkidu and Gilgamesh, and they slaughter the bull. And the gods get more angry. And then the god says, you know what? We're going to do something that's going to change this whole picture. And so they sent, they sent a disease that eventually kills Enkidu, Gilgamesh's best friend. He's dead, and Gilgamesh says, I need to find, I need to find the answer to bring my best friend Enkidu back to life. And Gilgamesh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the rest of my life searching for the answer to immortality. And he goes, the, the myth goes on and on about how he goes searching for the answer. And he spends the rest of his life searching for the answer of immortality, life after death. Do you know how that legend ends? It ends with him committing suicide because he never found it. He thought he had found it, but he never did. Folks, in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. And we don't have to spend the rest of our life searching the, the different ends of the world to find out if there is, there is life after death. There is life after death. And all we have to do to obtain it is to ask Jesus to save us from our sins. Do I hear an amen? We don't have to travel the rest of the world. We don't have to spend all our money. We don't have to spend all our energies. That is the greatest message on earth. And God has called you and me at this point in time to share that blessed message with everybody we know, with everybody that lives here in Hollister. God is calling us, you and me, to share the greatest message with others. When I, read, when I read about Jonah, I ask myself, am I prepared for eternity? Was Jonah prepared for eternity? You know, God had to work hard with the very person that he had called. He had to work hard with the, the greatest asset that he had at that point in time, Jonah. And Jonah was a lost man. A lost man preaching to a lost generation, 
and God still used him. Folks, all of us have been called before we were born. We were predestined to be saved. We were predestined to work with God. We were predestined to share this message. We were predestined at, to, be, to be alive at this point in the history of this world to do God's bidding. Don't ever think it was by chance, it was by accident, it was by some fluke that you're here today or that you have grasped this message of Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, but he resurrected and is in glory today and he's there advocating for your salvation and for me. Do you know what an advocate is? He's lawyering. He is there as a lawyer for you and for me. And even though the devil is saying, hey, he messed up, it's true. He messed up. But my sins still cover him. My sins. My sins? Who sins? Did Jesus sin? No. My blood. My blood, my innocent blood, covers you and me. As I look at this book of Jonah, I said to myself, God went to heaven. Jesus went to heaven. But before he left, He told his disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, I go and prepare for you a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Where is Jesus today? Yes, he's in heaven. Yes, he's advocating for you and me. He's lawyering for you and me. But he's also preparing a special place for you and me. He's got a special house, special place for you and me. And for everyone that puts their trust, their faith in him. And he's coming back. He's coming back. The book of Jonah begins with God addressing Jonah. And if you have your Bibles there, and just turn for one moment. It says here in chapter 1, it says here in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. In other words, God is, begins to speak with Jonah. It begins with God, but I want you to know The book of Jonah ends with God asking a question. It begins with God speaking, and it ends with God speaking. And in between all of that, from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 11, in between there is the story of Jonah. And that story is sort of, in many ways, your story And my story and how we've been growing up and we've been fighting against our own, our, our, our own bad habits and we've been fighting against our own proclivities and we've been struggling with our, with our own attitude and with, and, and our own inclinations and we've been struggling. But in the end, God has the last word. I want you to know God is going to have the last word. And I hope that the last word that you and I hear from the lips of God himself is because you have been faithful in these things. Come and enter into the glory of your Lord.
I hope that those will be the words that we hear. The book of Jonah tells us God has the last word. But also, I want you to know that when I read this book, I said to myself, if the story of Jonah would have finished in chapter 3, where we find him preaching, and we find the city of Nineveh basically repenting, and it was total repentance, it was corporate repentance like it's never happened before, from the highest levels of government to the lowest levels of society. It was, it was repentance at a level that has never been before or since. If we would only have read up to the end of chapter 3, you and I would have said, Jonah was one of the greatest. He was one of the greatest prophets. He was one of the greatest evangelists. Period. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there because we find that Jonah wasn't sincere in his preaching. His motivation wasn't right. And even though he had great success, he lacked integrity. Because even though he was preaching with his mouth, he wasn't preaching with his heart. And that's why when Jesus came, when Jesus came, he told the Jews of his generation, he told the Jews of his generation that the Ninevites would condemn them because they repented, but somebody greater than Jonah was preaching to them. When I look at how was Jesus preaching greater than, than Jonah, I want you to get your Bibles now and turn to the book of Matthew. Turn to the book of Matthew and I want you to read chapter 12, verse 41. If you have Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, this is an incredible verse. And it made the people of Jesus' time, particularly the scribes and Pharisees and the religious leaders, angry at him because he compared them to a wicked people. And notice what it says here, Matthew chapter 12. And it says here in verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and what? What does your Bible say? What does your Bible say? And condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but now one greater than Jonah is here. How was the preaching of Jesus greater? Both were Jews. Jesus Christ was a Jew. Jonah was a Jew. The people of Jesus' time thought, well, Jesus might be a prophet. Jonah, we all know, was a prophet. But in reality, you and I know one thing. Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. It was God made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and what? And the Word was God. And verse 14 there of First, uh, uh, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, and 
He dwelt among us, and the Word became flesh, and He dealt among us. The message of Jesus was greater than Jonah's? Oh, yeah. Jonah preached a negative message. Repent or die. Repent or die. How many of you would like to preach that message? Repent or die. It's almost like putting a gun in your head to your head. Repent or die. Jesus came, and he gave a message that was positive. He told the disciples, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The message of Jesus was positive. And he, and he, and he told people, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these other things, the things that you want, the things that you would like to have, they will come too. When I look at the preaching of Jesus, the preaching of Jesus was such that nobody has preached like him before or since, including Jonah. When I think about Jesus Jonah preached just to a limited audience, the inhabitants of Jonah, of of Nineveh. He preached to the Ninevites. But Jesus' message is still being preached to every nation, to every tribe, to all peoples. His word is still being preached, and it's a global, eternal message that will be continued to be preached throughout eternity. When I look at the difference between when Jonah preached with all his talents and all his gift and all his eloquence and the preaching of Jesus, there was one major difference. Jesus preached to people because he loved them. Jonah preached because God asked him to preach, but he didn't love them. You and I have to ask God, God, how can I make a difference with my family? And he will tell you, love them. If you ask God, God, how can I make a difference with my neighbors? He will tell you, love them. If you would ask this church, God, how can I make a difference in this community? He will tell you, go out and love these people. Go out and love the unlovable. Go out and love them. Because I love you, and God is love. The book of Jonah ends with a question. It ends with a question, and basically, God is asking Jonah, you know, do you think that, uh, that I was right, basically? Do you, do, do you think that I was wrong in saving the people of, of, of Nineveh? Do you think that, that I made a mistake? Do you think that I had my priorities right? And, and, and Jonah is angry, is angry at God. And, and when you're angry, you can't think clearly. And God has the last word saying, should I not be concerned about that great city And all those people in it, I was giving them the opportunity to hear the greatest message of all time. And I selected you to do my bidding. Folks, God is asking you to do his bidding today. He's asking you. He's asking me. 
He's asking my wife. He's asking all of us to share the greatest message man has ever held. And you have it. What will you do with it? I would like to ask, if you would like to give your talents to God and to make a difference in your family, would you raise your hand? Good Lord. If you would like to use your talents to make a difference for God in your neighborhood, would you raise your hand? And finally, if you would like to ask that you be used by God to make a difference in your church, would you raise your hand? I've seen all of you basically raise your hand. My hope and prayer is that you will also give your hearts to Jesus Christ so that you will make a difference in the city of Hollister, or wherever you may be in Zoom, or wherever God may place you in the future. Let us pray. Dear God, you've entrusted us with a special, unique message, Lord. A message that encompasses health. And you've told us that our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Help us to share that message. Look, you've, en you've entrusted us with the greatest message that of all time that there's life after death. And all we have to do is ask for your forgiveness. Help us, Lord. Help us to share that great message with others. You've entrusted us about the importance, Lord, of of family. You've entrusted us with the great message of Christian education. You've entrusted us with the great message of evangelism. You've entrusted us with so many important things as we face this last generation. Help us, Lord, to rededicate ourselves to your service and to go out of our way to do your bidding at this point in the history of this world. Bless this congregation, Lord. Bless this church here in Hollister. And bless everyone that is, that is out in Zoom land. And help us, Lord, to use our talents to bring others to the feet of Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen.
Dear God, as we come to the end of this service, we pray that you will use us in a special way that starting from this moment on, we can realize that we are your special ambassadors to the whole world and that you've given us gifts, you've given us resources, you've given us the ability to share Jesus Christ that saves. Be with this church, Lord, and be with every family here, be with every young person here, be with every visitor here, Lord, and be with those that are hearing us on Zoom land and help us, Lord, to always rededicate our lives every morning and every evening to you, for we ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to be dismissing now. I would just like to remind you to follow the instructions of the deacons as they dismiss you. They will be taking up the offering at the same time.